Hello? That's weird. Okay. <clears throat> so what we gonna do?
Come on, buddy. Can you hear me? I can. Oh, good. I wasn't sure if I was on yet. Hi. There are, uh, there are other people on, but they're muted. Oh, I Lisa's think. here. Okay. Great. Come on, we got a few more minutes. Oh, okay. How are you? I'm good. Good. I just watered my garden and I'm all bit up. Oh, no. Love me. Serious. <laughs> wow. Sweet. Me too. All bit up. So if I'm all if I'm all scratching, you know, there's even a mosquito bite on the sole of my foot. Wow. <laughs> oh wow! Hey Belinda, wow. how are you? Hello. I'm good. How are you? Good. Hello. Can you guys hear me okay? Because my mic was acting weird when I first got on. All right. I can. And it's not too loud. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, we I guess we could get started. Um Hazel said she was coming, but I don't see her on here. All right. Um I just wanted to say hi to everybody. It's been a long summer. Um, busy, busy at work, uh, still busy. I'll probably be busy until the end of September when it slows down. We have like 9-11 events and um, they have festivals in two towns. They got a seafood festival in one town and a, a full festival in another. So it, it's kind of busy for me. Um, but I did want to meet with everybody just to give them an update on what's been going on during the summer, because even though we don't have meetings, we do work <laughs> at this. And uh, in fact, we had a meeting yesterday that we'll talk about. But um, on, I noticed a lot of people questioning um, and asking about the spotted lantern fly. And so I asked Belinda to come uh, uh, on board and give us an update on the, the life cycle where the spotted lantern fly is now and what people can do to kill them or, you know, uh, mitigate next year's crop, which will probably, if we don't, you know, work through the winter, uh, find, find in their little patches of eggs, then, you know, they're gonna be popping all over the place next year. Uh, in Egg Harbor City, I saw a few, I'd say maybe a half dozen over the summer. Uh, my neighbor across the street had a lot of them in her hostas. And, uh, <clears throat> but people on Facebook have been questioning. They even sent us an email asking what the city is doing to, um, you know, mitigate the, the spotter and lanternfly. And a lot, there's really nothing the city can do. 
there, there was a grant put out by the state to uh, counties where they could get like ten thousand dollars for so that they could spray. But it would not be aerial spraying; it would probably be topical spraying. So I would assume I don't know if uh, Atlanta County got the grant or requested the funding, but if I'll, I'll check it out and let everybody know, because if you if you see them in your yard, maybe we could call the county and they could come out and spray uh, a tree or whatever. Well, and that, so, and that if I could just interrupt for one yes. second, I heard there was a fifteen thousand dollar grant. That's what I was going to ask you about that municipalities can get, but they have to contract a regular. Um, what do you call them? Bug. Yes, uh, medic. Yeah, you have to um, contract the company to do it. So well, I don't know if that's true, but we would like to do that if we could get well, the grant. Is like, she looks like she's going to say something. <laughs> she knows something we don't. <laughs> okay, so the 15000 is actually the county grant, as far as I know. And we've been coordinating with the county and the municipalities. We had several people call us here at Cooperative Extension. And um, so we're trying to see if we can find some other options out there. Um, but that is true that you actually do have to be to do um, widespread spraying like that because they're just using um, really the, the normal insecticides they would use. You do have to have people who are specifically licensed to do that. Um, so I, that is something that the county is working on. I, I'm pretty sure that they applied for the grant. Um, but I have to be honest, 15000 is not going to go very far in a county the size of Atlanta County. Um, so we're going to talk about that um, as part of what I'm going to talk about tonight okay, um, and what that kind of means to, for, for you as homeowners. Yeah, good. And I, I'm just going to throw in there that it doesn't sound like Nanette and her her um, neighbors are seeing any, but my husband's a hunter and he's been out in the woods and they are all over every single tree out there. Really? He's about ready to get a bleach thing and spray them, but I don't even know if you're allowed to do that. Where does he we hunt? Where, where's he at? Uh, around the lake area. Oh boy. That makes sense. No, well, it's bad out there. It's real you bad. Aerial spraying out there, but you know, the only problem with, you know, I'm Blend will probably talk about that with spraying like that is that it also could kill the beneficial bees and so forth. Yeah. So, so I didn't know what to do? I told him to, I don't think bleach is a good idea, but maybe, I don't know. Excuse sorry. me. Sorry. To oh. During the uh, during the uh, citywide uh, yard sale, we set up across the street on Buffalo Avenue, and we killed about fifteen. No kidding. Yeah, we just they're stepped up. They're here. Yeah. I think they're in the woods. That's why we don't see them here. They might be here too, but they're mostly in the woods. Yeah, and they they blow, You know, the wind blows them easily, so because they don't fly very far. So mm -hmm. I live right on the edge of Egg Harbor City and Galloway um, in Blue Heron Pines, and I have not seen a single one in that area, but, um, and, and we'll talk about this in a second, but there is really sort of an interesting line in Atlantic County that goes from Hamilton Township, Mays Landing, um, and kind of um, over through Galloway a little, and Hamilton. Um, you haven't seen them as, as much near the coast. They're, they're there. They were actually the first place we saw them originally. Um, so they're there. They're just not in, in the largest numbers. The largest numbers seem to be in a band that go across um, mm. Hamilton and um, and then into Galloway. So, um, but like I said, it, it's not all over Galloway. So it's just, you know, sort of like a weird line where they've set up. But, um, but you've probably seen them everywhere or you may have seen them in small numbers in some places and large numbers in other places. And that may depend on what species of trees you have around. So that, that's going to be one big thing is if it's something that's attracting them, then you'll see a lot of them. If you don't have something that is as attractive to them, you may not see as many. Do you want me to kind of get started? Then, yes, or? please. Okay. Um, can I share my screen? Or Yes. All right. So I'm going to assume that everyone here knows what a spotted lanternfly is. So I'm going to skip the first part of this um, presentation. If there's anyone who doesn't know what a spotted lantern play is, please stop me and I'll go back. But um, I think we're kind of beyond that. But I am gonna um, I am gonna start actually at this stage because um, as much as it seems like you're not gonna see as many of those, you are gonna see a few of them. So um, 
what you saw very early in uh, or late spring, early summer were probably these um, black with the um, white polka dots. Those are the first two in stars, um, the nymphs of uh, the, as, as they were starting to hatch um, uh, from the egg sacs. And we're gonna spend a lot, a lot more time on the egg sacs because that's what we're about to go into and what the really important stage is for us to try to get rid of. Um, what you're probably seeing now is you may still be seeing that fourth instar, which is the red with the black and white um, on it, but you probably are not seeing as many of those anymore. Um, we probably moved on to the adults, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. I'm going to stop here. This is what you're probably seeing a lot of, and this, um, this photo right here is not really very representative of what you're seeing out there. That's um, for one, there's something brown behind it. So it makes it look more like a golden color, but what you see is really gonna look like this gray color right here. Um, and probably you're seeing, um, depending on where you are in our county right now, you might be seeing them in clusters on trees that look like this, or you may be just seeing an individual one in here and there. Um, I've seen quite a few in Hamilton Township where you um, you really see them in like the big clusters um, at the community garden there. I took some pictures on trees where they were just in, in you know, covering the trunks of trees. Um, so one thing about the spotted lanternflies, they really do, and we'll go through the different ones that they attract to, they attract a certain species of trees. Um, so that part is really important. If you are in an area that's a lot more um, concentrated with uh, conifers and pine trees, um, you're not going to see as many of them because they don't really attract to those trees. But if you have a lot of birch and willow, um, walnut trees, uh, maple trees, um, and of course, we've all heard tree of heaven. If there are a lot of tree of heaven in your area, you're going to see a lot of them, uh, particularly there. Uh, but you'll also see them in those other species as well. Um, so this is the stage right now that it's um, important for us to get as rid of as many as we can. So as you see them, even if it's only one, um, please step on it and smash it. And a little tip, for, they are leaf hoppers, they're not moths. So they're actually going to kind of avoid flying um unless they feel threatened and then they're going to fly and you'll notice they don't fly very far they it's more like a fly hop than it is a really flying uh like you would think of like a butterfly or a moth that's going to fly for a long period of time they're really just going to fly to get quickly to get to another spot um if you come from up above them or from behind them they are easier to smash than if they if you try to come from in front of them because they can't see you um, so you want to try to come from, uh, otherwise they'll hop and you'll be chasing them. <laughs> right. So, um, which can be funny, but not very effective. So, um, but if you can kind of come from a direction where they don't see you coming, you can usually smash them pretty easily. Um, and they usually, here's the funny thing, they will hop pretty quickly the first two times, but they sort of lose a little oomph after that. Okay. Um, so usually the third hop, they don't usually hop as fast. Um, so even if it hops twice, you can usually grab it on that third one and smash it. Um, now, for each one of these that you kill, this is where it gets really important because we're about to enter this next stage. Um, and you probably, if you look close, um, a lot of our area is already in this next stage and that's where they're laying their egg sacs. Um, now, the egg sacs, I'm going to show you what they look like. You've probably um, seen them and not noticed them at this point because they're not they're not laying a bunch of them because, you know, a lot of them are just now going into that adult stage. So normally we would say that from July to about the end of August, um, you're not really seeing egg sacs. However, I have seen them in the area. So we do know that they're already laying their eggs, unfortunately, a little bit earlier than we normally would expect them to. So we would usually expect that in um, early September to mid-September. But each one of those adults is going to lay 30 to 50 eggs per egg mass. So for uh, so think of each one of the one that you kill could be 50. Um, so that really could make a, a very large dent in it. And particularly in our area of area of Atlantic County, and I don't want to say there's any area of Atlantic County that it's not important, but particularly in um, that band that we're talking about where they really seem to set up this summer, um, there are a lot of farms in the area. 
So um, that's where we really want to be kind of vigilant around here and trying to get rid of as many as we possibly can um, safely. And I say safely because I don't want people climbing up into the tops of tree of heaven and getting hurt trying to get to them because that's actually, while it feels like it's going to be helpful, um, risking people getting hurt is actually not that helpful. Um, but what you want to do is if, if we concentrate just on the area that we can reach safely and down, that's a lot of spotted lanternfly that we can get rid of. So um, what we want you to do, and um, I'm going to use, I actually have some cards that, um, and then I will either drop them, I can drop them off to you, or I can drop some off to the library, but, um, but the spotted lantern fly card is about the size of a credit card. So um, I'm gonna use my driver's license. So it's about this size. Um, and what we want you to do is look for these egg masses. So I've, I've put up here, these are kind of three different stages of the egg mass. This middle one is um, a pretty fresh uh, one that was, that was um, you know, uh, probably laid pretty soon um, before this picture was taken. So it's kind of shiny. Um, it looks like like a grayish brown mud splotch. Um, we've shown it all on trees here with the exception of this uh, third photo. Um, but the difference between the spotted lanternfly and many of the insects that we normally deal with is that a lot of these insects normally would look for rough surfaces. Spotted lanternfly do not. They will lay their eggs literally anywhere, on your barbecue grill, on your beach chairs, on your deck, um, on trees, obviously, um, but they're not discriminatory. They, uh, it doesn't matter if it's a smooth surface or a rough surface, they will lay them anywhere. So um, you wanna kind of keep your eye out for these egg masses. It's a little deceiving when you see them on a computer screen because you think that they're really big. They're actually not. That's probably only about a couple of inches long. Um, so they're kind of small. As we move into the winter and they've been there for a little while, you kind of get this cracked kind of look um, as they kind of dry out. That does not mean that they're dead. They're not, they are just really encased in there. Um, so whether it's a shiny egg mass or a cracked kind of uh, dry looking egg mass, they're still alive in there. And next spring they will still hatch and go out into our trees. Um, so uh, they're, they're kind of a white color when they're when they're laying them, but like I said, they they turn to that gray brown mud looking color, um, and it it really will almost look like a splotch of mud wherever they wherever you see an egg mass. So what we want you to do is you can do it with a credit card, or I have some um, some spotted lantern fly cards that actually have instructions on them of how to kill the egg masses. Um, and exact, you know, at a step by step, and they're a little bit thicker than a credit card. Like your driver's license is kind of flimsy these days. So these are really thick and stiff, and they're gonna they're gonna keep you from, uh, you know, they'll they'll actually allow you to um, smash them. So I'm gonna use my hand as an example. So if this were what your spotted lanternfly egg mass is on, you want to take that credit card um, or the spotted lanternfly card, whatever, and smash down it pressing really hard because you want to smash as many of the eggs as you can as you're just, you know, just this first run. Um, have available a baggie that has some, um, some alcohol or uh, hand sanitizer is what we use a lot here. Um, it's pretty easy to get a hold of now. It wasn't about a year ago, but it is now. Um, so hand sanitizer works great. That actually works great anytime you're trying to preserve a bug, um, but also kill it at the same time. So if you're bringing something to me to identify, that's a great thing to put it in, is some uh, hand sanitizer. So a little baggie with some hand sanitizer in it. After you smashed them, now you're going to take them and scrape them into that bag. Um, you, can, you can get a lot of egg masses in one bag. So um, you want to get as many in that bag as you can and then zip it closed and kind of squish it around. So take it and squish that, um, that hand sanitizer so that you get um, all of those eggs as covered as possible. Because um, we want to really try to make sure that they're dead because we're going to throw them in the garbage. Um, we do recommend that you double bag it. 
Um, if you're not comfortable with putting that much plastic in, I, I get it, you know, because we all kind of cringe at the plastic. Um, and that's why I say you can use that one bag for a lot of egg masses. It's not one egg mass and then you zip it and double back it and bag it. Um, all the egg masses that you find, keep putting, putting them in that bag, squishing it around, um, killing the eggs. And then um, you want to throw them in the garbage and make sure that you don't scrape them into the woods because if you didn't kill any of the eggs, then they'll just, you know, they'll go ahead and hatch next spring. Um, I'm going to skip this video because she's basically going to tell you uh, what I just told you. Um, she'll actually show you how to do it, but um, it's the same thing. You're just going to, like I said, smash it really hard. So like press that card on the egg mass to try to kill, smash them then then scrape them off into the baggie, um, squish them around, and then dispose of them. So I wanna talk a little about the host plants um, because I think that's some of the reason why they're more concentrated in some areas than they are in others. But also we wanna be really cognizant that some of their host plants are very similar to our native plants and you wanna make sure that you identify them correctly. Um, for instance, Tree of Heaven, um, we thought that they needed the tree of heaven to complete their life cycle. But what we're finding now is they don't necessarily need it to complete the life cycle, but it is a highly preferred um, host for them. The reason for that is it comes from the same area. So it kind of makes sense. It's also an invasive species. Um, so you, really not something that we should be planting here anyway, uh, but something, and something that spreads and chokes out a lot of our natives but it looks a lot like some of our natives as well. So we wanna be careful. If you are not sure that something is a tree of heaven, um, send me a picture and I will be happy to take a look at it and give you a positive identification. That way we avoid taking things out like walnut, hickory, ash, locust, um, and uh, some of our other native species because when they are small, let me move myself out of the way so I can see this. Um, particularly sumac, when it's small, a little seed, a seedling, it looks almost exactly like a tree of heaven seedling. So they can easily be taken one from the other. And what we had people doing was taking out a lot of sumac rather than taking out tree of heaven um, because they thought that it was the right plant, but it actually wasn't. So we're happy to identify them for you. Um, and as I just said, I live right by Atlanta, uh, by uh, Egg Harbor City. So if there was ever a time you just wanted me to come over and look on my way home, um, I, I can usually work that out. It's not a problem. Um, I can't come to everybody's house, but if we had like a day where you wanted me to come look at a few things then I could absolutely do that. Um, but they will actually feed on more than 70 plant species. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, one thing I wanna emphasize here and this is where we get into uh, what we were talking about at the very beginning. And when we talk, when we talk about um, some of the management things, um, how to manage them, we'll get a little more into this. And that is that um, in the home garden, they're more of a nuisance pest than anything. So um, if you are, like I said, in our area, we have a lot of farms around. So that's why it becomes a little more important in this area that we really pay attention and try to get, get rid of as many as we can. But actually in your, your home garden, um, they're not gonna do as much damage as they can do to a lot of our agriculture. Um, they can devastate um, your uh, vineyards. So that's where we've actually had um, a vineyard in New Jersey that had to take out everything and start over. So they can be very devastating to some crops, particularly it seems to be grapes right now. Um, we did think that it was apples and peaches, but um, what they have found through further research is that the apples and peaches are affected. They do attract to them. So it's not that they're not affecting them at all, but they don't seem to make the dent in apple and peach production that we feared that they would. So that's actually a good news. Of, that, that's a little bit of good news there. So they do still attract to them, but not in the numbers that, that we were afraid they would. So it's not taking out our apple orchards um, and peach orchards. It is Unfortunately, um, it can be pretty devastating to the grapes. Within your home garden, um, what they do, and this is where they, they kind of become a problem there, is that they, because they're a leaf hopper, they have that little mouth part that they're gonna stick down into the stems and the leaves um, of your plants. What they leave behind is probably the biggest problem. Now, yes, they're going to pull some stuff out of there and you'll get some dead leaves and um, some of the part, the, uh, 
the plant will turn yellow, but that would probably not kill the plant. It might, um, you know, it, it, visually it's going to look like it's a sickly plant. What happens though is that they leave behind honeydew, which causes problems with um, mildew, bacteria, um, viruses. It opens up your plant to other problems. It also invites in other insects that will create other problems. So what it does essentially is it causes kind of a snowball effect. Um, so they kind of start the process. Um, you know, they kill a little bit of the plant by killing some of the leaves. And then, but it's that sticky residue that they leave behind that really creates the larger problems. That also can be your clue that you have an infestation. So if you see um, a lot of mildew around and things like that uh, around the bottom of your plant, that can usually be an indication that you have um, a, an infestation of the spotted lantern fly. So, um, as I said earlier, um, July and August, we typically would say that's when you wouldn't see those egg sacs, but we are starting to see them. We were actually seeing them. Um, I had people telling me they had seen them during the 4-H fair, so that was um, almost two weeks ago. And um, so we saw them fairly early. Not necessarily a good sign, but um, you know, getting as many people out there, this is that kind of information that we say, don't just sit here and listen to it tonight, share it. So tell everyone how to kill those egg masses, how to squish them, how to get rid of them. Um, give them, you know, the tips that I'm going to give you on how to manage them within your own garden. Um, share all of those things. And I'll be happy to send um, the fact sheets that Rutgers has. I would also recommend that you go to the Penn State website. If you go to Spotted Lantern, Lantern Fly um, and either put in Penn State or Rutgers, um, you will get a wealth of information that you can share with people, particularly some homeowner guides um, and some pesticide recommendations. I want us to be careful about pesticides, though, and I don't like to spend a lot of time on this particular thing because uh, the systemic applications, um, you can get them for in the home garden. But um, I really want you to be careful with those because at certain times of year, as we well know, we can cause a lot of damage to our pollinators. And we wanna be really careful of doing that. Um, the, the spring, particularly, that's where we say, don't spray anything, use soapy water um, during those time periods. Um, let me get to the, here's some, I'm gonna go back to management in just a moment. Um, some of our natural enemies, a lot of people have asked me, well, don't we have anything here that will kill them? We do. What we don't have is things that will kill them in the volume that we need them to. So we do have the um, predatory insects, spiders, uh, fungi, our birds, and then a lot of our generalist insects are gonna, uh, they do um, eat them. You will often see, um, see them in spider webs. You'll see praying mantis eating them, um, but they just can't eat them in the volume that they exist at this point. So that is kind of a problem. Um, and right now we're researching some other ways to get rid of them um, without introducing another insect. So their natural predators are, of course, where they come from. Um, and they came here probably on shipping containers or uh, something like that. So, um, you know, we, we just don't have the, the predatory insects that can eat them in the volume that they, that they seem to be um, multiplying. Okay. So they're not harmful to you or your pets. Um, we, in all the research that's been done to this point, um, there are no known toxins in them. So they don't bite um, and they're not, they're, there's nothing about them that's poisonous at this point. Now we do, if you have animals, you know that your animals eat things that they shouldn't eat. So do children. Um, if they eat a lot of spotted lantern fly or they eat something and you're just not sure, um, you, you should still probably call your vet. You know, that just makes sense. So be careful with that. And plus right now people are a little antsy about it. So they're spraying everything on them. So if you have an animal that has ingested quite a few of them, I would still say you should call your vet. If you called our office and said, hey, my dog ate probably 12 spotted lanternfly, what I'm gonna tell you is call your vet. They may tell you it's not a problem if they're not acting sick, but you just always wanna be careful, right? Um, but at this point, we don't see anything that is toxic um, and we haven't had any, any pet 
or human gets sick from them. Okay, so management in the home garden. Um, I, I wanna stick to management in the home garden because you don't have as many things available to you in New Jersey that our farmers do. That's a good thing. We don't ever want, I want everyone to have um, access to all the pesticides because um, we want to make sure that the pesticides stay in the hands of people that we train specially to use them properly, right? That's why New Jersey has one of the most strict um, pesticide laws in the country and we wanna keep it that way. So here are some things that you can do in your home garden to help uh, minimize them. They're very susceptible to multiple insecticides. So many of the insecticides that you use for, um, for other, other um, insects in your garden, you can also use for the uh, spotted lanternfly and they seem to be very effective on them. Um, like I uh, started talking about a moment ago, you wanna be careful about um, reading the labels to all of the insecticides, whether they're organic or non-organic, whatever you choose to use, please make sure that you go by the label. Normally I would say, look for the specific pest, but in this case, the spotted lanternfly may not be on there yet because it's so new in this area. However, make sure that you're using it in the way that, it's, uh, that it says it to be used. So if it says don't use it in the middle of the day, there's a reason why it says don't use it in the middle of the day. Um, if it wants you to use it later at night, it's probably because that's when many of our pollinators are not as active. So we want you to use it when your pollinators are not active and you're not going to be actively killing pollinators. Um, so make sure that you use them according to label instructions. Um, I would say, and this is because I'm always a, an advocate of using the least toxic option, um, I would go with um, trying soap and water first, 1% um, dish soap to, uh, and then in water. So three ounces to 30 ounces of water will actually um, kill the spotted lanternfly in the adult stage. So you can actually just spray them on there, spray them, spray it onto the plants, which keep, keeps, keeps them from um, sticking on there. Neem oil has also been very effective against the nymphs, not effective against the adults though, unfortunately. So if you're still seeing those red ones around, then you can still use it on those. It does not seem to be as effective when it comes to the adults. It will stun the adults and allow you, that's where I say like spray it on the plant. It will stun them for just a moment. It won't kill them, but it will stun them long enough for you to smash them. Um, so it's helpful and um, probably one of the least toxic ways that we can, we can start to get rid of as many as we want. Um, again, if you get into insecticides, um, you wanna make sure that you're going by the law, uh, the, the label, the label is the law. We always say that to people, um, but also um, make sure that it's labeled for plant hoppers. Because um, remember, this is not a moth. Um, it's, a, it's actually a leaf hopper. So if you look for one that is for, leaf hoppers, plant hoppers, then you'll be using an insecticide that should be effective on them. In areas of high infestation, meaning you've seen more than 500, um, typically in Egg Harbor City, you have probably not, unless you're out in the woods where there are a lot of those um, species that they're really attracting to. Um, Particularly against that adult stage, the insecticides can be applied to the trunk. Um, I, there's a couple of uh, di uh, dinotephrin, um, imidacloprid, uh, I cannot pronounce that one, I'm so sorry, imidacloprid, uh, I'm probably saying that completely wrong, but um, you want to do that before July. Um, the dinotephrin, you want to do after June. Um, again, that's part of that trying to protect our pollinators as much as possible. Um, so in the beginning of August, that's when your adults are typically found in the higher numbers. So that's what we're seeing now. Um, Tree of Heaven, Black Walnut, Sycamore, Red Maple, River Birch. Um, we've seen them on Silver Maples as well um, and Willows. So um, like I said earlier, that presence of the city mold is gonna give you that clue that you've probably got an infestation higher up. So even if you're not seeing them low down, there may be an infestation higher up. Um, so you can put them in uh, soil drenches from July to September to target those adults. Um, if your property is highly infested, 
what we would recommend is contacting a landscape or an arborist um, for control applications. They have access to things that they can actually inject into the trees that will, um, you know, some of the things that we're working on are um, injections that whenever they feed on the tree, it actually um, sterilizes the males. So then that's going to reduce the population of them. Um, but they, uh, the landscape and arborists, um, you would want to look for one that is actually licensed to be taking care of um, spotted lanternfly. And um, many of the ones in our area are. If they have pesticide license, they are likely uh, licensed to, um, to take care of spotted lanternfly. The reason we do that is that we want to make sure that people aren't just willy-nilly um, spraying all the insecticides out there um, because we want to protect the pollinators. We're trying to um, not create a bigger problem while trying to get rid of this problem because then we're, we're actually not helping ourselves, right? Um, and again, in the home garden, it's likely not going to um, kill your plants, um, particularly in those smaller numbers, uh, but it is gonna leave that, that honeydew and things like that behind. That's what can, you can use that soapy water for. That'll kind of uh, get rid of a lot of that honeydew which, which will um, avoid other problems coming in like the sooty mold, um, other bacteria and um, viral diseases that can come into your plants. As we go into the fall um, and you know what, what we're having problems with right now are a lot of your molds because it's been hot and it's been humid. So that's where they grow. Um, once you get into the fall, you'll have problems with, um, you know, as we start to cool off in the evenings, we'll start to have uh, issues with other things. Um, so uh, people have been asking me, are we in a quarantine county? At this point, no, they did not yet uh, quarantine Atlantic County. Um, I think I've told this group before, but I'll say it again. Um, the quarantine doesn't really mean a lot for a homeowner. Um, it's really more of a legal term in terms of commercial. Um, so what that does is whenever they quarantine a county, it means that then your commercial driver, so people who are driving trucks from place to place, um, actually have a checklist that they are required by law to go through before crossing lines. So um, that's where that really becomes an issue. For a homeowner, um, we're still gonna ask you to, to keep in mind that checklist and this is the checklist. Um, we want you to look before you leave. So we do know that they're in our area. We know that they're actually everywhere here in the Mid-Atlantic at this point and up in the Northeast. Um, I believe there are 11 states that have them at this point. Um, so you wanna check your vehicle. They will hide in places that um, you would kind of be surprised at and they are very resilient. They will stay on your car for a very long time. They hide in your wheel wells. So that's something that uh, an area that you really wanna check, particularly if you have a truck with an open bed, um, you wanna kind of take a look in there, make sure that you don't have any hiding in there so you're not moving them from place to place. Um, inspect any items that are being moved. So if you are taking bikes or beach chairs or, or tents, um, camping equipment, anything like that, um, just kind of take a look and make sure that they haven't laid any eggs on it um, or that you don't have any adults because they will, once they hop onto something, um, it's amazing how much they can really stick on to there. Um, so just kind of, you know, make sure that you're not moving them as much as uh, possible. And if you do find them, just remove them and destroy them. Um, we wanna try to remove the host trees as much as possible. Um, there are people who will call and say, can you make someone from the county come out and remove all of the tree of heaven? <laughs> the honest answer is no. Um, it, it's unfortunately not realistic for us to do that because um, we are in an area that they're um, so prevalent at this point because um, they've been invasive here for a long time. So we have a lot of them and they spread very easily. So um, your bigger ones, we're probably not gonna be able to get, get rid of all of those. But what we can do is as we see those small seedlings come up, pull those out. And then that way they're not, they don't continue to spread. And we get, get, we get rid of two things at one time. We reduce the number of spotted lanternfly and then we also reduce the number of another invasive species in our area. Um, they actually have a tendency to choke out our native species. Um, so, you know, also something that we need to get rid of. 
Um, but are we going to, is the county able to come out and take out uh, five, 15, 20 foot tree of heaven? No. Um, unfortunately, we just don't have the manpower to be able to do that or the ability to do that at this point. Um, is the county going to come out and spray? Probably not. Um, I don't think that there's anywhere, even in Pennsylvania, where anyone's doing any kind of aerial spraying at this point. Um, what it, I, I don't know how the grant is going to go, but the grant was, um, it, th that is something that's been offered. Um, I believe it was a USDA grant, and I know that the county is checking into that. So probably what they would do is concentrate on areas where um, they have the most spotted lanternfly. Um, that would be where they would concentrate first, because 15,000 is not going to go very far. So luckily, um, in most of Egg Harbor City, um, they're not infested that we know of. Um, there are some areas where we really have some pretty big infestations, and those would likely be where we would go first, and then we would move out into the other areas. Um, but, uh, but know that in the background, the county is very on top of it. Um, everyone's looking at options for us to work on this, and particularly because we have so many farms that potentially could be affected by this. Um, and they're a big nuisance everywhere because um, I, I don't, if you've only had a few, you may not really realize how gross they really are, for lack of a better way to put it. But really, there's like a drippy, sappy nastiness that happens when you have an infestation of them. And they just cover everything with that, that sticky honeydew. Um, so, um, you know, if you can spray that off with a good stream of water um, or soapy water, then um, that's going to be helpful also just to keep that off the tree so that we don't end up with other um, bacterial and viral issues in the plants. Now, um, we do still ask that you report sightings. And where you can do that is Bad Bug NJ. Um, I'm going to have the websites up. I think it's the next one. So this is where you can uh, report them to. Um, there is actually a reporting tool that when you click on it, um, it's going to ask for, um, in fact, you know what, I'll click on it and I'll show you what it looks like. So when you go to that website, this is what you're going to see. And when you come down here, there's a little um, uh, submit a report. You're going to click on there and um, fill out this form. So it's going to ask for your first name, your last name, a phone number. Um, I have to be honest with you, no one's going to call you. It is there because we're kind of inundated with calls statewide. So no worries, no one's going to call you on it. Um, an email address is helpful. And what that would really be for more than anything is um, if you're in an area where we haven't seen as many before and suddenly we get a lot of reports, someone might reach out and just say, hey, where did you find it if you don't put a location in here? Um, but it's kind of unlikely at this point because there's so many calls coming in that they're gonna do anything more than log it so that we know where the concentrations are within the state. And the other thing that's gonna ask is approximately where you are. Um, so you're going to kind of move in the map here and um, and tell it where it is. So is it a residential location? Is it a farm location? Um, particularly if you are around a vineyard location, I would say that is really, really important information. Um, but also uh, parks, uh, airport railroad, um, or a business, and then citing details. What's really helpful here is if you can give a photo and approximately how many you saw. So if you just saw one or two, um, you know, just, just put maybe one, one or two. But if you saw a lot, that's where it's going to be really important information because that's where we start to see where our infestations are. Um, one or two is actually a good sign. That means we probably don't have an infestation in your area. But if you're seeing 30 to 50, then that's a lot because um, you don't just see 30 to 50 in one small area. Um, and again, keep in mind, 30 to 50 means that um, for each one of those 30 to 50, there will be 30 to 50 more if we don't kill them before they lay their eggs. Um, and if you can, this is not required information, but if you can tell us the um, plant that it was on, um, that's really helpful information. And what that information is being used for is we've done some studies on, um, you know, what is the, the 
um, distance from a tree of heaven to other species that they're also um, attracting to. So last year we um, we had a site here um, at our office that we were watching. And then there were sites in uh, different areas of the state where we were um, watching oaks that were within 15 feet of a tree of heaven um, and how that affected the population. Um, so that gives us a little more information in some of the research um, going forward. Um, and then it lets you pick what life stage. So of course, right now you're probably gonna be choosing the adult, but if you're still seeing these late nymphs, um, that's really helpful information because that tells us like how long um, it's taking to get to that adult stage where we're only seeing adults. Um, so the more information you can give us, the better, uh, but any information is better than no information. Um, and there are some people who just say, you know what, this is a lot, I'm confused. If you can give us a photo, that's very helpful. Um, if you're having a hard time with this form, you can always call the Master Gardener Helpline. Um, we always have volunteers here Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, but anyone here at the office would uh, help you, help walk you through this, um, this form, and we could even fill it out while we have you on the phone. Yep. Okay. So let me go, go back to the presentation. So that's where you would, um, I, this was a presentation we created early on and they were at one time asking for you to email, um, but I would say um, this is less effective. The reporting tool is the more effective way for you to, uh, to let us know where you found them at this point. Um, this email is probably so packed that we may not be getting as much information off of that. And again, you can always call Rutgers Cooperative Extension and um, we can report it for you as well. Um, the reason I put these references here are these are just in general some really great references for you as homeowners um, to be able to go and find out additional information. Um, I put Penn State up at the top, not because Rutgers doesn't have a lot of information. Of course, Rutgers and the New Jersey Department of Agriculture have a lot of information at this point. Um, and a little more specific information to New Jersey. Uh, but Penn State has, uh, that's where they came into. So of course they've been researching for a lot longer. And at this point they have quite a few webinars. Um, if you have a few moments and you really wanna dig very deep into um, what's going on with the spotted lanternfly um, research, they have some excellent webinars that are available um, on their site that you can click on um, that are anywhere from uh, five minutes to two hours. Um, so depending on how deep you want to dig and, and how long you have to sit there and listen to it, um, there's some really interesting research going on and um, some really interesting stuff that's come out of there. So, um, so I, I just like to let people know that um, there really is some great information out there. And even if all of this was too fast and later on, um, you have questions, you can either call me or go to any one of these sites and, um, and there's, there's lots of information available there. Everyone at Rutgers Cooperative Extension at this point um, we can either give you information spotted, on Spotted Lanternfly or they will get you to one of the agents or to me to get you information on what you can do. And I will drop by, um, uh, then it would it'd be easier for me to drop them by to you or to drop them to the library. I have some cards that you could uh, give out or just have available to residents. And then I also have um, several different um, fact sheets that we could have available. All right, just drop them to my house, uh, okay. 349 Buffalo, and then I'll get them some to City Hall and because uh, a lot of people go in and out of there and the library. Okay, great. I'll bring you a box of cards. Oh, great. Um, please hand them out to, is I, I actually collected them from several counties that weren't giving them out as much. Um, so I collected them for the 4-H fair and I have quite a few left. Um, so I can, I can drop a, you know, a box down to you and then I can drop some uh, back sheets as well. I have some that are, that are better because they're in, they're in color and they can actually see the life stage that each one of them's in. Uh, what they look like in each stage of the development and then some management practices. What you saw on this, um, this slide was actually, uh, is uh, one of the fact sheets I have as well. Um, I also will drop off a list of homeowner recommendations. There are on that website that I just showed you, um, if you also go, let me go back to, um, if you go to homeowner resources, 
Um, I'm going to drop by some copies of this, but I also wanted to let you know that you can go online and get this uh, sheet as well. Um, um, there's the reporting tool. Let's see if they took it off. If they took it off, I, either way, I'm going to drop you off some copies of it. But there is a list of homeowner uh, options for using. Uh, this is just the um, this is just the information handout, and I'll drop off some of these. But also, uh, there's a list of homeowner recommendations uh, for things that you can use. And the great thing about the chart that um, that I'm going to drop off is that. Um, it actually tells you in each one of them, it's got a column that's going to tell you how long that's going to last. So if it's an insecticide that if you use it has a lot more residual effects, um, there's two, reason why, two reasons why that's important. Um, it's, it's important because of how, what time of year you'll use it. So um, there are certain times of years that you would not want to use uh, some insecticides because they last for a long time and we don't want them to last for a long time because you have your pollinators coming out during the day. Um, and then there are some that's going to say it's just a spray it and it's gone, uh, particularly things like soap and water, things like that. So it's a really good chart so that you have an idea of what the residual effect is for each thing that you're spraying. Um, and it really gives you a good you know, ability to choose. These are some, some things that I would rather use to be a little more environmentally friendly, as opposed to I'm infested and I need to get rid of a lot of these. Um, so I really like this chart. It's one of the better charts that I've seen. And um, I really thought that it was on here, but they may have taken it off um, at this point. That's the, uh, that's the checklist. Let me see if it is on here. No, unfortunately, I don't see it anymore, but uh, but I still have a copy of it. And like I said, it's a, it's a really good chart, um, especially for looking at, um, it's this chart right here. So this is basically what it's gonna look like. It's just a more, um, it, it's a more extensive chart. It's a larger version of this with a few more things on there. But like I said, it's gonna tell you the residual activity of it. So is it variable? Is it good? Um, it tells you when the recommended timing is, so July to September or after flowering in July. Um, and then some of them say before July or before June um, and not to use them. It also tells you if it's non-toxic, slightly toxic, moderately or highly toxic. Um, so that's why I really like that particular chart. And um, I'll give you the expanded version of it. So it's got all of the different options on there. Um, all right, so I believe that's all I have on my presentation, but I am going to open it up for any questions that you have. So I'm going to stop sharing here for a second. Here. We got one question in chat, and they want to know if you'll send us the PowerPoint. Um, absolutely. Yes, I'd be happy to. Okay. I'm going to share. And what I'll do, Nanette, I'll, I'll send you the PowerPoint with the links active. So I'll send it in a PDF form with the links active. That way they can click on each one of those things to go visit those sites. And we're, we also will post this video, we, and we do it with all our meetings on our website on the information page. Uh, okay, great. Our meetings there. So if anybody, if anybody asks anybody who's here now, how can I, you know, find out what Belinda said? Just direct them to sustainableehc.org to the information page, and it'll probably be at the bottom of the page, the, the most recent one. So. And that's true of anything. Like if people want to know what the green team's up to, they can just watch our videos. And like I said, um, I know I keep preaching this, but you know, um, just please opt for the least toxic options that you possibly can. Yeah. Um, keeping in mind that in the home garden, they're more of a nuisance than, than anything. And we want to be careful not to kill our pollinators inadvertently by while we're trying to get rid of spotted lanternfly. Um, one thing that we've said, uh, Penn State talked about is that, um, you know, where they first started, um, they don't seem to be seeing as many of them. So it's kind of that ripple effect that's coming out. And we just happen oh. to be in that outer ripple right now. Oh, um, now, whether or not that will come back in another cycle, we don't know yet because, you know, we're, we're still in the middle of it. But, um, but you know, uh, as it goes on, we'll have a little more information, but, um, but I would say, you know, particularly in summer, like right now, when we know we have a lot of our pollinators, our monarchs and things like that around, um, opt for as, as little yeah. 
as you and, possibly can. And this is the um, monarch butterfly season when you're going to see them flying right. around and God, we, they're already endangered. You right. Know. So just, you know, so let's opt for things like the neem oil. Uh, the neem oil is not really going to help you right now. This, the soapy water will at least kind of stun them so that you can step on them. Um, but I would say at this point, let's concentrate on the egg masses. They're starting to lay those. Let's get rid of those because for every one of those we get rid of, that's getting rid of 30 to 50 of them. So a lot more effective option. All right. Anybody have questions for Belinda? All right, well, great. Thank you so much. I know you have another event or meeting to go to, so I'll let you fly, but I really appreciate you making the time to meet with us on no short notice. I, I only contacted her on Friday, but. <laughs> yeah, Thanks. anytime, just let me know. Okay, thank you. All right, yeah, bye, bye everyone. Have a good night. Bye-bye, thank bye. you. Thanks. Thank you. Well, that was informative. Um, yeah, like I said, if anybody has questions, I mean, I get asked all the time and I'm on a lot of different Facebook pages and I see so many people worried about them and they're, they're skeevy more than anything, <laughs> but they are pretty when they're young. Um, so um, let's go on to our grant updates. Um, yesterday we had a Zoom meeting uh, with um, our engineer, and Jody and the Sustainable Jersey folks about our community energy planning grant that we got. It's a $25,000 grant and it's an 18 month cycle. Uh, what this will do is give our green team, uh, what Ryan will do, I think Ryan is gonna do most of the work. Um, we, they're gonna look at things like um, EVs, EV infrastructure and purchasing EVs for our fleet at the municipality. Um, we're gonna do stuff for the community, how uh, educating the public about how they can save energy by upgrading to solar or whatever. And they, they shared some statistics yesterday and we ha they said, we have a lot of solar for such a small town. There's a lot oh. of homes that already have it. So, and that was really, you know, encouraging that people are already on the, you know, saving energy. Cool. And um, there was some other thing too that they said, Egg Harbor City, I don't remember what it was, but they said Egg Harbor City's like well ahead of the game. They, it's, most towns have like a hundred and we had like 450, whatever that is. I don't remember exactly what it was. Um, then we'll look at, um, um, environment, some environmental justice issues, um, um, expanding clean energy and in the community and with the commercial properties and so forth. So the way this is gonna work is I think we have to start with a small group of people, uh, just Ryan, uh, me, um, anybody else who wants to attend this and kind of like narrow the, the scope down a little bit. And then Ryan will do the deep dive. They provided the sustainable Jersey folks have already provided a lot of the data that's needed to measure uh, where we are now and where we want to go. But it, it sounds like a, it, it would kind of like create a blueprint for our future in Egg Harbor City and you know what projects we can get done over the coming years. Um, this there is no implementation funding available, but with all the infrastructure and um, the, the recent money coming out of the federal government, there will be grants to help us get some of these things accomplished. And it's just having this plan, well, it's kind of like shovel ready projects. Well, we already did the study and we have the information. Now we, now we can go ahead and apply for grants and so forth. So it'll really be helpful in the future. Um, and so this, this community energy planning team would likely include um, Ryan, Jody. I'd like maybe Kim, if you could be involved because you're on city council and mayor, if you're interested in, in moving this stuff forward. Uh, so we'll have, hopefully we'll have uh, something put together in the next couple of weeks. Um, and then we're gonna have to host a public meeting where we can have the public come in 
and give us their thoughts and ideas and maybe look at pitfalls where some things might not work and other things they, you know, they want to really definitely see go forward, uh, say with uh, EVs and um, that's the big thing right now is getting funding because the funding is available and the, the uh, tax credits are available for people who purchase EVs. It uh, means like $4,000 tax credit if you purchase an EV. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more because ACUA is having a drive electric event in a couple of weeks. So that's pretty much where we're at with that grant. Um, we applied for the stewardship grant uh, for the nature trail. Uh, that's $5,000, um, and most of the work was done by um, Mike over here. Uh, he, had, he did a great plan that we submitted, and they, they complimented us on that. So that, to me, is hopeful. Uh, so they said that they would notify um, towns either at the end of August or early September. So within a week or so, we should know if we got that grant. Uh, we were also contacted by the Pinelands Preservation Alliance uh, for, they're gonna be applying for the uh, forestry grant that we got to, to do the street trees. They're gonna apply for one, I guess, to do uh, maybe a, a larger planting project. And they offered us trees uh, in that, if they get that grant, which they probably will. Um, so they offered us trees and I, I, they are like, how many do you need? And I was like, I don't know, but, well, where we need trees now is in that uh, around the fire pit area to prevent the ATV riders to, from getting in and going down those little hills. So if we could get large, get them to provide the larger scrub pines and things like that and get them planted uh, up, up around that ridge. And that, would... I, I don't want to interrupt you, but I don't want to forget. We need um, the, the insurance company made us cut down some trees on the lake. If we could get some big pine trees for the lake, that would be great. Like right around the water, you know, where the shade shade area is, where the benches are. Oh yeah, I saw one, I sit in front of the one stump. Yeah, it looks terrible. Yeah, well. What place says, no. Yeah, well, we could, we could let them know what we want. I have to write a letter of uh, support. So, I mean, it's kind of up in the air yet. I don't know what their plan is and what they're applying for, but as soon as I get that, I'll be able to send them a letter of support from the green team. Did they and, give them for yeah. trees that they give us? I'm sorry, you were going in and out. I didn't hear what you said. Did they have a, a maximum number of trees? Did they have like? I said 20, but you know, he said, oh, we could give you more than that. So I, I'm sure that they'll, they'll provide whatever we need. But I think with, with that Pinelands Preservation Organization, we should really concentrate in the areas where, at, like out of town and, and not street trees. Because so, there's, I know Lisa had said one time there's um, infestation in some areas out in the woods that, you know, nobody sees it, but there may need to be plantings out there too. So that's with um, the Stewardship Grant and the Pinelands Preservation Alliance uh, Planning Assistance. And um, our Community Forestry Grant for $30,000 right now, Jody is, I don't know, I was hoping she would be here tonight. Uh, she's finding, uh, working on locating a contractor to do the planning. And once we, we know who's going to do it, we can set a meeting for the residents who are requesting trees. And we want them to come in and be educated on how to care for this tree. Now, we, we have an, another problem to deal with, and that's that we're in a drought, pretty much. Um, we're in the like first stage of a drought. It's not as serious as some other parts of the state, but um, we do, you know, have, when's the last time it rained? It rained the other night for five minutes, you right. know, and today it was supposed to rain today and we were supposed to have storms, but it was gorgeous all day, you know, so we, they're really going to have to concentrate on watering. And um, if, if we do any plantings on public property, which I think there's some on um, New York Avenue that we're planting um, going into the high school, we're gonna have to make arrangements for somebody to really make sure that they get watered. Um, I don't know if the city has a, an old truck or if they're gonna be getting new trucks anytime soon, 
maybe they could keep one of the an old pickup and put a barrel on it that we could fill up with water and drive around and water public trees. I'm worried about the trees we planted last year or the year before in Lincoln Park that are still very young that mm. might be susceptible to the heat. So uh, and the and the dryness. So you know we really have to think about it and and take some action on that. Um, so we'll have that mandatory tree maintenance meeting and maybe we could serve some refreshments to get the people to come. I don't know where it should be held. Um, City Hall, you know, it's where we usually have meetings like that, but it might be nice to have something out in the community and there's some funding available in the grant to take care of stuff, stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> and then the other thing I wanted to talk about, and I think I had mentioned this to Kim, before is that I noticed driving around town, a lot of our street trees have suckers coming out from the root system and um, you know vines growing up the tree. There's one down the end of the street here that's covered with ivy. It's going to it's just going to kill the tree. So um, if we as a green team and, and Dick Colby's already been doing this, he, he let me know today that he's been going out and clipping the, the vines off the bottom of the trees in his neighborhood and when he goes out for a walk. So he said he got himself one of those heavy loppers and uh, he's been doing it. So if anybody else, you know, feels the ink so inclined, just walk up and down your own street and clip the, the, the suckers coming out. It will help the tree leaf out next spring. If we do this through the winter, maybe we could do it as a team one day on a Saturday, a nice day in the fall. And uh, we, maybe we did it at Lincoln Park one day where we, we took care of all those, the bottom of those, all those trees. So, uh, Nanette, I just want to mention that some of those vines are so thick, they're like trees themselves. Yeah. Wow. We need a heavy duty um, lopper. Packer, actually, yeah. I don't yeah. even think you could get that with a lopper. Yeah, we need one of those, like maybe a, a small uh, chainsaw or something. Yeah, that's something that I was hoping that someday we could get a grant to do and have it done. Yeah. You know, because well, around where I live, there's tons of them. The forestry grant uh, used to have a maintenance um, grant uh, available, and it was for a lot of money. You could get up to two hundred thousand dollars for tree maintenance. And it, it, you know, if it ever comes available again. I will apply for that, and hopefully, maybe we could have uh, a tree maintenance company company come in and trim our trees that need trimming, and maybe even remove some trees that are dead or going to die. And uh, so, yeah, that's that's a great idea. Someday, when we have a lot of money in the city, we could have our public works do it. <laughs> I happen to notice next to the log cabin, Lisa. You may know who did it they happen to cut the suckers off the bottoms of the trees going up burger and all alongside of the log log cabin there. Uh, I noticed it the other day. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure who it did it, but whoever did, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Might've been Dick. Yeah. He couldn't come tonight. He had another meeting, but um, he, he, he gave me a list of stuff to make sure I mentioned. Uh, oh, and uh, we talked about the drought, you know, Let's just work on that. Um, and then I just wanted to share some upcoming events. And first one is uh, tomorrow at Reed's Farm. If it, nobody's been out there, uh, it's Cookie Till's Farm, uh, Organic Farm. They're having a Cape May, um, Atlantic Cape May Hub event on food security. Uh, I had sent it to Candace, hoping that she would attend the event. But if anybody else is interested in what could be done to, you know, make food more, uh, fresh foods make more available in the community. They should go to that. Uh, talks a lot about uh, farmers markets and things like that. I wanted to set up uh, a green drinks event, uh, just basically as a way to get people interested in joining the green team. And I, I, I'm, I'm available on Tuesdays uh, the um, 6th, 13th, 6th and the 13th this month. So, I mean, sorry, in September. So if, do, do those dates work with the people who are here? It would be like an evening. And I don't know if you've ever been to a green drinks event, but it's, I know. 
it, yeah, it's just basically show up and have a drink and talk about the environment. Um, and there's no agenda or anything like that. And it's just kind of like networking uh, people interested in the environment. Nice. And uh, I'm just thinking um, either Renault or um, Firehouse would be nice. Uh, I would ask them to put out some appetizers for everybody, but when you show up at these events, you, you have your own check and you buy, if you want to buy food, you buy food. If you want to drink, you drink and you pay your own bill. So it doesn't cost us anything. Cool. Are those dates okay with everybody? Yes, for me. What was the dates again? Uh, either the 6th or the 13th of September. It's a Tuesday, they're Tuesdays. Yeah, there's a lot coming up. All those other days are blacked out. Yeah. <laughs> um, Good for me. On um, September 17th at the 4-H park, they're having Bark in the Park. And I definitely want to attend that one. There's a rain date the next day. Um, I want to attend that because I have been trying to get Pet Parenting 101 off the ground for about two or three years now. And we have so many dogs in the community, mostly dogs and some cats, um, that we really need to make sure that people know our ordinances for uh, picking up after your dog, feeding wild animals, things like that. So if we could do pet parenting, I wanna go there, see what the vendors they have. Maybe we could set something up in the spring next year around the time they do the uh, rabies shots for the pets and uh, maybe we could uh, have like a little pet fair or somewhere. I probably at the, at the uh, public works yard. Um, so if anybody's interested in going over, you know, find out if, what what they're offering. I'm sure they'll have vendors there and so forth. Yeah, you know, it would be a really good idea, which I think we did it one time when Maggie D'Amber was around. We had a pet parade. Yeah, that, that would, would be, be a big draw. That'd be great. You know, come in costume and stuff. It'd be nice to do around Halloween. <laughs> well, I don't know if we have enough time Halloween. to plan it, but I think that would bring a lot of people in. If we did it down Philadelphia Avenue, you know, it would help out the vendors and, you know, the stores and all that jazz. Yeah. Uh, I, the only thing I'd be co concerned about is um, liability if something should happen. So uh, you got to check and see if we're covered for that. Okay. I think we are. I mean, Rotary does it. You know, you just have to, you're a city entity, so we're covered with insurance. Right. Mayor, are you talking about the, the Halloween parade? Uh, no, I'm, I'm just talking pepper. about um, just a pet parade. Okay. Um, because he just talked about the Halloween parade again today. Yeah, I, I don't think we should go with the Halloween parade. We okay. can do it around that time or, you know. Okay. I think it should be a separate thing. You know yeah, what I mean? Definitely. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. <clears throat> and a part of the pet parenting 101 would include like uh, shipping your pet, uh, making sure that, you know, giving information about the rabies shot, um, giving a list of maybe veterinarians in the area, it's things like that. Um, there's, a, I remember I asked an Absecan medical uh, pet, pet what is it, a veterinary hospital come, and they said they would come and they would do a program. And they sent me a list of like 12 myths about your dog, uh, <laughs> which were really informative because you think uh, dogs shouldn't eat this or they should eat that or whatever. And so it gives you, they gave a lot of information. And many, many, many years ago, I went to a, an event on, oh, what was her name? She lived on Deer Street. She had a farm and she had a veterinarian come and talk about how to properly feed your pet. And he said, feed him everything, <laughs> throw an egg in there, shells and all. And that's because that cat, the shells contain calcium and it helps their bones and just like an adult, you know? Um, so it was really interesting. And he, he talked a lot about how to read uh, the labels on pet food to make Thanks. sure you're getting good food for your for your animal so that was it stuck with me and i do it now when i when i well i give my cat my dog one particular kind of food all the time but 
you know. Our dogs, they would eat like peppers, cauliflower, broccoli, any veggies. As soon as we started feeding the stuff out in the room, the dogs started eating it. And then they would just chow down on veggies all the time. We've really seen dogs do that, but ours did. Yeah, and then when you don't want to give it to them, you can't you tell them you can't have people food. <laughs> My dogs love lettuce. I swear, I think they're part lettuce. Fast. All they do is eat lettuce. They love it. They hear it, they yeah. hear it when you get out of the refrigerator. Oh, no, they look and spinach. It. They like spinach. <laughs> That's great. And then ACUA, I think that's uh, Rick Dovey on the line here. I don't know if he's there. I, 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 well, I'm on the line. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, they're having the drive electric events uh, Tuesday and Wednesday, September 27th and 28th. On the 27th, it's online, and they're going to talk about everything about EVs. And then on the 28th, it's in person at the ACUA. And so, Rick, do you want to you can mention anything about that? Well, the yeah, on Tuesday, it's at noon, it's online, and the information's on our website. And basically, you can hear from uh, folks from the industry and, and learn all about EVs and the incentive programs. In past years, we've had in-person seminars uh, folks from uh, New Jersey DP and the Board of Public Utilities and the electric company come and speak and we'll we'll do that again. So that'll be the opportunity from two, 12 on uh, on Tuesday the 27th. And then the next day on Wednesday from uh, 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. we'll have an on-site um, EV show where people can um, show off their EV cars that they have vehicles uh and also electric bikes and basically you can talk to people that have been driving uh ev vehicles and kind and in some cases they'll actually take you for a ride so usually i would say we have up to 20 25 vehicles and and the owners now of course in the last year ev you know evs have really spread so it's um <clears throat> There, there's a lot more people that are interested in doing this and ex uh, basically describing their experience and also the incentives and how that worked for them and so forth. And you'll get to see the, the wide range of EV vehicles that are, are available. So they're not all Teslas and they all don't cost an arm and a leg. Uh, and um, so there's some pretty um, 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 <coughs> inexpensive relatively and when you're buying a car uh vehicles that are available that are total evs and you get to talk about the mileage and so forth so it's it's very interesting will there be any dealers there yeah and sometimes uh we've had ford there before uh we usually try to reach out to them Who, whoever has them uh in a local and is trying to sell them and has the time available they usually come. So um, the Ford dealer in Egg Harbor Township has been there uh, several times. Well, I uh, talked to Mayor Nick Russo in Longport, and he has a little Fiat 500E, and it's only a couple of years old. It's got 35,000 miles, and he's looking to sell it for $13,000. <laughs> I was like, oh, that, I can afford that. <laughs> so um maybe i'll tell him about it he could bring it bring it over and uh see if somebody wants to buy it okay. but that'll, that'll be informative if anybody's interested that'll help us with that um that energy planning grant we'll get a lot of information that we could share with the public about that so and yeah i'm about 100 150 people usually come good good i'm i'm planning on going i might even write a story about it um because there's a lot of teslas on the island that's like they're very common <laughs> um then item e is the uh annual uh shade tree federation conference is being held uh, last year and the year before i think it was in online but this year it's back in person again it's a two-day event in cherry hill and we we usually are represented at that they give you continuing education units that we can use to apply when we need to apply for grants. And our um, shade, shade tree, what is it? The shade tree plan is uh, expiring in 2023. So 
we're going to need to get that. I think it's like a three thousand dollar grant that Jody applies for to pay for an arborist to do our plan for the next three years. And I was looking through our last plan over the summer, and we accomplished a lot of stuff on that we had planned to do three years ago. So, and he he did an excellent job, and he started from scratch. It wasn't like a boilerplate type thing. He he came here, he drove the streets, looked at the trees, um, and gave us suggestions. And then we had a meeting with him, and actually two meetings with him, and. Uh, he prepared the plan. It was submitted to council. They accepted it. And, uh, you know, you put those things in a drawer and you forget about them after a while. But I, I pulled it out and looked at it. And we're, we're pretty close to achieving a lot of the things in there uh, with some of the programs we've had over the years. Uh, the one thing that I, I asked Jody to do this year that she did in her budgeting is to create a line item for tree anything like anything public work has to do, like if they take down a tree or if they, you know, do anything regarding trees uh, to put it in a separate line item so that we could track it. And if we, um, I think it's uh, uh, $2 per capita. So it would be $8,000 because we have like 4,000 people living here. Uh, we can apply to become Tree City USA designation. And that would, you know, they, they'd give you signage to put up at the entrances to the city and let people know that we really love our trees here in Egg Harbor. And, uh, you know, with the tree planting that we're doing, all those hours working on those things account towards it. So um, Jody, Jody did that earlier this year. I don't know if you noticed that in the budget, but that's a good thing. And then she's also going to, um, we're going to have a, a shredding event um, she has, it's probably in, in October sometime, uh, but we were contacted by Port Republic. Uh, we usually do Mullica. So this year it'll be three towns participating, which really cuts the cost down for the sit, for the truck to come. And uh, we usually said that she said she thought she wanted to do it in conjunction with the um, event they're having in October on the Avenue. Um, there's gonna be like an Oktoberfest. You know anything about that? Supposedly October 6th, the Economic Development Corporation is supposed to be planning a fall festival, but I, you know, I haven't heard anything else about it since the, um, no, wait, it's not, it's not the 6th. That's, that was supposed to be when I was supposed to do the mayor's 5k run, but I think it might be the following weekend, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. I think it's the 13th, that. Well, we, she had said, "Lo, that'd be nice to do that at, in conjunction with that. And yeah, yeah it would do it, you know, we'll see. But it we need a like drive through. It sounds need like a, a drive through. You yeah. know, that you're going to be able to pull your truck in, unload and drive out. So right. I'm wondering if the bank, either the, to, the, the, the old bank on uh, the, the terrace. Yeah. The house. Like if we could use that drive through there and have the truck park there. People just drive through and out, which would be nice. So can I, that's can I interject, uh, Lisa? I put it down as the fifteenth, the was fall the festival. 15th, fall, fall festival is that what we're talking is about? Right? Is it a Saturday? Is that date a Saturday? It's a Saturday. Yeah, and then that's probably what it is. Yeah, that's probably what it is then. Okay. October fifteenth. Yeah, I got it in there as 15 too. Yeah, 12. All right, that's all I got. I'm out of breath. Anybody have anything for the good of the cause? Anybody want to bring up any topics or anything? No, I'd just like to say thank you to everybody. Nanette, you work so hard with your agenda and all that stuff and everything you do. Thank you very much. And thank you to everybody who's participating. You know, I think we have a good group here and we have, I think a lot more people that are interested, but maybe they just didn't sign on tonight. Yeah, well, you know, it's hard, you know, when you don't have a newspaper. I know. The city listen. anymore. Well, it, we, listen, we do not exist in the current anymore. And I don't know what I can do about it, but we, we get nothing. Well, the nothing. only thing you can do about it is send them stuff to publish. You know, if nobody sends them anything, they're not coming to write a story. They have no reporters. They have like two or three people for the whole county. Well, the whole I told you, 
Charlie told me that he's only allowed to write two articles. So how's that even possible if they don't have reporters? I'm confused. Well, he's a stringer. He gets like 50 bucks to write a story. He's not a staffer. Like I'm a staffer. I get paid a salary right. and I don't need benefits, but they pay benefits too. Um, you know, they don't have people like that anymore. And I, I just recently public, published something on my Facebook page that Gannett, the company I used to work for when I worked for the Egg Harbor News, they laid off, they have two reporters for the, no, four reporters for the Courier Post and two for the Daily Journal in Vineland. That's, you know, so basically what they're telling us is if you want news published, you have to send it to us copy ready. Wow. And, and they'll copy it and they'll put it in their paper. Well, maybe, I don't think I don't think the press is going to be printing much longer, to tell you the truth. No? They got rid of Scott Kronick, and that's their big money maker is that Thursday edition. And he just went over to Shore, uh, Shore Local, the uh, what's her name, the magazine, yeah, that color magazine. So he's going to be working over there now. I just saw it posted today. Well, maybe so. you could send me the um, link for to send articles and things like that. Because I just haven't bothered lately. You got to go onto the website, and there's a whole. It's a it's a mess. It's It's a hot mess. But you know, we we put I put everything on the Facebook, which you know, and you do too. But how many viewers do we have there? We have over two thousand. Okay. So, but you know, that they're all fooled by different hater Facebook pages and whatnot. You know what I mean? So, unless it says official Facebook page, they're not going to get the information. So I don't know how we can get around that, but that's the only source of outlet that we really have. And Instagram too. Dana Seaver does the Instagram uploads. Yeah, she did a great job with the um, video for the Olympics. Yeah. With the music and all, it was really cute. Uh, I enjoyed that. (laughs) Um, Anybody else? The only thing that I can add to that is I do have somebody that I've been talking to, but it's for it at the press. And she gave me like a step by step, you know, of what to do. So I could send that off to you, Lisa. Oh, good. You... Thanks. Kim. That would be okay. great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You gotta yeah do your nails too. look nice, Kim. Yeah, I was going to say that. Yes, my nails. Oh, really? You could see them up there? <laughs> <laughs> I, I see this little thing here. So I, I can't see them. <laughs> they, they look good. <laughs> they must be. Mike, you got white. anything for us tonight? No, not much. Just looking How forward to your vacation. Oh, it was awesome. We just got back on Sunday. We were gone for right around three weeks or so. Wow. So, uh, so we cool. got school starting up soon and the summer. I'm looking forward to getting more free time once the kids are back in school. So uh, right now I'm kind of like you know dad duty having. To, make the fun every day for them <laughs> so we did do the uh the, the scouts camp both of both of our kids did that scouts camp for a week they really enjoyed that at the lake that was very well ran so yeah nothing much just really hoping we uh, get this grant and can get moving on it yeah all right who left <laughs> somebody left like my whole screen changed <laughs> all right i have nothing else if nobody has anything else to offer um we can sign off but thanks uh, for coming. I really okay. appreciate Thank you. Thank you, Nanette. Um, Good night. I'll let you know when the green drinks thing is. Okay. Uh, Nanette, right. I, I, Nanette, I can only do the sixth. Okay. So, you know, so if, if all right. I'll, I'll make it then. Thanks. Okay. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.